Okay, it is now uh, four o'clock Paris time. So I think we can uh, start our conference, our AWA conference. So welcome everyone, dear colleagues and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have the pleasure to welcome today Michael Denty. You might all know him. Um, he's an archaeologist specialized in the ancient Near East and more specifically on bronze and iron ages. Um, Michael, you have conducted field works in Iran, Syria, and Iraq, and you are currently the uh, program manager of Penn's Iraq Heritage Stabilization Program. And as such, you conduct uh, ongoing excavations in Nimrud and Nineveh, which is uh, the subject of your conference. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, Michael, well, it was perfect. The floor is yours now. Thank you very much. Uh, I, can, I can hear everyone now. Hopefully, everyone can hear me okay. I'd lost audio for a short period of time there. No, it's okay. We can't hear you. Very good. So good morning, everybody, or afternoon, or good evening. Thank you, Barbara and Jafar and the Arwa community for inviting me to speak today about the Iraq Heritage Stabilization Program of the University of Pennsylvania and the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage of Iraq's excavations at Nineveh and Nimrud. I'm going to start off with a brief introduction to IHSP, or the Iraq Heritage Stabilization Program which is headquartered at University of Pennsylvania, and then discuss our recent 22 excavations at Mashki Gate at Nineveh and at the site of Nimrud in the Adad Narari III palace or so-called palace, and some of our work in the area of the Ishtar temple. So the Iraq Heritage Stabilization Program was founded in 2018 through a State Department grant to conduct assessments, emergency response and stabilization projects, and some research initiatives in Northern Iraq. We've since expanded into Northern Syria as well. The focus of the project was to mitigate the effects of cultural cleansing and genocide and conflict in the region following the ISIS occupation. And we're focused on preserving and protecting cultural memory, identity, diversity, and freedom of expression essentially enhancing and expanding access to cultural heritage, which we believe is a fundamental human right. Uh, in particular, there is an emphasis in our choice of projects on preserving the cultural heritage of ethnic and religious minority communities and working really closely with local stakeholders in these projects. So a few of our projects right now, before I talk about our excavations at Mashki Gate and our work in Nineveh, uh, one of our projects in the old city of Mosul is the restoration of the Ottoman era Beit Tatunji, which was hit in by airstrikes while it was militarized by the Islamic State. And this project is nearing completion in 2023. It's a spectacular central courtyard house with elaborate Mosul marble or gypsum relief <clears throat> carving in its facades. We're working to restore the sanctuary of Sheikh Adi at the site of Lalish near Sheikh Ad, the principal religious site of the Yazid community. That project is also nearing completion. Uh, and we're working yeah. in the area of Marayin, south of Baghdad, in the restoration of the Tak Kisra at Tesafon, the largest freestanding masonry arch from antiquity. This was, uh, unfortunately, there were several collapses of masonry from from the arch in recent years, and we're working now to conduct an emergency conservation project there. And finally, we're doing a number of projects in the area of the so-called Nineveh Plains, east of the city of Mosul, uh, and in the area of East Mosul itself, the urban area north of Nineveh. One of our projects there is the rebuilding of two churches at the Monastery of St. George or Der Margorgas in the northern part of East Mosul. That project is now complete and both uh, churches have been re-sanctified. And in the Nineveh Plains, we're rebuilding churches that were burned or deliberately destroyed in performative deliberate destructions by ISIS. This is in the city of Karakosh or Baghdida, the restoration of the church of Mar Sargis and Bakos, which is now re-sanctified and operating again. Now, we also work at archeological sites and we conduct a lot of security projects at sites, cameras, fencing, 
So not all of our projects are rebuilding or, or these large rehabilitations. We've currently now finished uh, or have nearly finished 17 projects in the region. And if you're interested in reading more about our project, please check out our website uh, for the Iraq Heritage Stabilization Program. Now, specifically today, we're talking about our archeological heritage and we'll start with the site of Nineveh where we are currently working at the Moshki Gate which was one of many gates at Nineveh that was constructed or reconstructed during the reign of Sennacherib sometime around 695 BC, as he modified the city to make it his imperial capital. Uh, Mashki Gate is associated with the god Ea and translates roughly to the gate of the watering places. And it provided access to the Tigris River on the western western side of Nineveh, north of the citadel mound of Kuyunjik. It was close to or immediately next to the Tigris River. Not exactly sure where the Tigris was at that point in time, but it was certainly close or closer than it is today. Moshki Gate was destroyed in 612 BC in a fire, like much of the monumental architecture and other gates of the city. Mashki Gate was excavated by Tarak Madlum in the late 1960s, I think starting in 1968 and into the early 1970s. Uh, also uh, working at the site was Suleiman Salman. The site was uh, the site was then reconstructed over a period of time, primarily in the early to mid 1970s, and then that reconstruction was subsequently modified and restored several times. There were particular problems with water displacement on the flat roof of the site. So there was a lot of damage in the, in the succeeding decades to the Moshki Gate. The results of the excavations were published in a really cursory format in the journal Sumer. There are a few brief mentions of the types of finds inside the gate, that the gate was burned and that there was a destruction deposit. And there was some coverage of the, the different phases or stages in the reconstruction of the gate. But again, there are, as far as we can tell, there are no surviving collections or archives. And there's very little information beyond these short reports in the journal Sumer. We were awarded a project 2019-2020 to, to rebuild Moshki Gate following its destruction, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, that this was a, a grant from the Olive Foundation. Since the gate is in a very prominent position on the highway between uh, Mosul and Dohuk, it's something people see every day. The State Board of Antiquities and Heritage in Nineveh really wanted to rebuild this gate and other gates following the ISIS occupation of the city. Before we could do that, obviously we first had to demine and clear the rubble from the ISIS destruction of the gate. And then we needed to do some forensic archaeology, really look at what archaeological deposits were still present at the site. We were aware that there probably would be levels below the gate that had not been excavated and that adjacent areas to the gate had not been excavated either, based on the reports published by Tarek Madlum. And we also knew that in some ways the reconstruction was not complete either. So what was there archaeologically? From an archaeological standpoint, how was the gate reconstructed? What was the basis for that reconstruction? Also, what were the methods used in that reconstruction? Archaeology is a good way to peel apart previous reconstructions like this. And what, what other archaeology was intact in the surrounding area in this part of the city of Nineveh? So here's a plan of Moshki Gate that I've recently done that shows our various excavation areas in inside the gate. And this is a modification of the plan that was produced by Tarek Madlum in 1968. So Madlum excavated mostly the two entrances into the gate, this area in front of the gate or on the west hand side where this parapet wall is situated, and then the hall. And then you can these areas to the south of the gate and outside the gate were not previously excavated. So we were excavating in areas that we knew that Madlum and his his uh, colleagues had excavated, but also in some new areas outside the gate and to its cell. The hall is 25 by 6.5 meters. It's lined with orthostats, um, and the outside of the gate is also uh, lined with orthostats on the eastern side. So quite a bit of, of plain, undecorated orthostats. You have two large flanking towers in the front of the gate on the west-hand side here. These are constructed today out of baked brick with some 
Portland cement layers inside of it for stabilization. Those would have been constructed out of mud bricks in antiquity. They were a standard standardized size of 37 by 37 by 12 centimeters during the reign of Sennacherib. In the front of the gate, Tarek Madlum, where you see Tower 1, 2, 3, and 4, Madlum spent a lot of time in this area where he recovered stone masonry, where he found a stepped rampart that he believed came down directly to the Tigris River that would have been situated against this stepped stone embankment. Uh, and then the remains of the base of the a wall, a stone wall with towers, evenly spaced towers. These were, uh, there were bits of a, crenna, a crenellated parapet. There's a paved wall walk behind this area. And really what you have is a stepped rampart or embankment with a crenellated parapet uh, with towers on a wall walk out in front. We haven't excavated in this area yet since it's immediately along the highway and outside of our, our construction wall for security reasons. But it would be hopefully in the future, it would be great to be able to go back and work in that area as well. Uh, Moshke Gate was subs subsequently excavated in the late 1980s, early 1990s by the University of California, Berkeley, uh, by Stronach and a team from, from Britain and the United States and Australia. Uh, they worked primarily in, an, in the area on the east side of the gate in a administrative complex, uh, multiple levels of this one building called MG22 which is very important. We think that a lot of these gates have these administrative complexes immediately on the inside of the gate structures. Recently, uh, there's been a publication on the pottery and we hope that there'll be more publications on the MG22 area in the near future. We're not working in that area, but we are working in this area where there are these shops or stalls located here. And what we've seen so far, that this is a very accurate reconstruction of what the inner city with this lower town area looked like during the reign of Sennacherib and sub subsequent rulers. Unfortunately, uh, like a lot of Nineveh, Mashki Gate was deliberately destroyed by the Islamic State in April of 2016. They took an earth mover to the reconstruction of the gate and essentially just toppled the entire structure. It looked pretty bad at the time. I was working for ACE or CHI Cultural Heritage Initiative, so we were following this through local sources in Mosul and through satellite imagery while this was unfolding. Other deliberate destructions also obviously occurring at the site of Nineveh. And what Islamic State effectively did is they created a, a, a tell out of the, the, the upper parts of, of the gate so that as we began to clear it, you can see that tell here in the lower photograph of what the site looked like in 2019, 2020 when we began the project. Um, it wasn't really clear what was, what was, really gonna, what was going to be below that, that destruction level. Uh, the first job then was to make sure there was no unexploded ordnance or mines at the site, which is a frequent problem on a lot of our projects, and then to go in and clear the, the debris from the ISIS destruction. This was completed very quickly uh, and efficiently by the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, the Nineveh Inspections Office. And here you see what was underneath that ISIS rubble pile, uh, uh, several meters. Uh, two to three meters of, of the gate structure. The orthostats on this, you're looking at the eastern side or the inside of the city side of the gate. You can see that the orthostats are still intact and we have cleared at this point into new areas here in the south on this side of the inside of the gate structure. So uh, there's quite a bit of the gate that's still left. A lot of this is Modlum's reconstruction, but inside and underneath of this, there are, uh, the archeological remains are fairly intact. So again, ISIS did a lot of destruction to the upper stages of the gate, but they really didn't touch the lower part of it so much. Uh, to preserve those remains, we've been using these temporary roof structures over the top of the gate to keep the rain, snow off of, off of the archeological remains and the reconstructed remains because they're easily damaged by water. These roofs can be raised up while we're rebuilding the gate so that it provides protection to our masonry while we're working. We've conducted some, I'll just quickly go through some of the excavation areas, and then we'll get to the, the piece de resistance here in a second. Uh, outside on the eastern side of the gate, we've been excavating a deep sounding along the face of the orthostats to look at the foundations, the base of these orthostats and the foundations of the gate itself, and then looking at how that relates to the stratigraphy 
of the eastern lower town. We've got the wall trenches into which the orthostats were placed during the construction of the gate by Sennacherib's workmen. You can see the cut of this wall trench coming down from the surface at which time the gate was built. And you can see the limestone chipping and limestone powder from the working of these slabs in place when they were brought in for the outside of the gate. As we you move to the east of this area, what we have are several layers of a pebble paved street or open space that presumably runs north south along the interface of the gateway. In other areas, this is area G. What we've been doing is, is excavating out the Islamic State damage. Islamic State used an earth mover to inside the hall of the gate to knock loose some of Sennacherib's orthostats in these areas. You can see several of them that have been knocked loose here, and you can see the Sennacherib inscription on the back of one of these right here. All of the slabs have these inscriptions on them as far as we know. And then inside of this, what we've done is we've stripped away the outermost layer of the baked brick that Maud Loom used in the reconstruction of the gate tower here. And we're looking at the actual section of his architectural reconstruction so that we can get some idea of the building techniques that the antiquities department used in the 1960s and 70s. And they used a lot of Portland cement and metal uh, reinforcement rods, this sort of concrete flat work, followed by layers of baked brick to form the bases of these towers. And so we're looking at the structural engineering implications of this and certainly the sustainability implications of all of this for our reconstruction of the gate. In the corner here, area G, as we dig down, we find that there's an uppermost floor level that is associated with the 612 destruction of the gate during the reign of Sinshar Ishkun. That was the layer that Maud Loom and, and the Iraqis excavated down to where they found apparently a burn level with a lot of artifacts, some of which may be the, the remains of a second or upper story of the gate falling down into the hall. Below that, there are, are is at least one, sometimes more intermediate floor levels. And then we usually have a mud brick platform with a floor service immediately on top of it that represents the building of the gate during the reign of Sennacherib. And in the corners of the structure, so far, I think in all the corners except for one, we find these baked brick uh, boxes, oftentimes with a lid on top, where there would have been foundation deposits, but these were apparently either excavated during Maud Loom's time, he does mention finding at least one prism, or subsequently. And we do find bits and pieces of bronze and other objects inside of these and some clean sand as fill, but they have all been empty so far. At the, the outer area of the gate, where you enter the city from, you know, from the Tigris side, we've excavated down at the corners uh, in previously unexcavated areas, and we found the door pivots. On both sides, we have these large limestone door pivots set in place. Uh, they do not have inscriptions on them. The earlier two, there's one above another, so we have two layers of these or two levels of door pivots in this area with corresponding early floors. Um, so we have two of these there right at the base of the orthostats. This is a good view of what the orthostats look like. There's usually two of these divots at the bases of the orthostats. They're unfinished up to a certain point. And then you, usually you have the first or Sennacherib floor level right at about this level. These door pivots were set down below the floor level to a certain extent to take the posts of the gate. We have not found door pivots in this area where you see area J and K at this time, but these were not previously reported. And then you can see that Slabs are very roughly finished and then up above there, they're neatly smoothed and polished. And then you can see the types of disturbances that we're dealing with. After Maud Loom constructed the gate, there was a lot of, of further uh, disturbance to the archaeological deposits where there was trenching to bring in uh, water lines and also electrical lines. So while we have intact archaeological deposits, frequently we're finding these, these, this trenching along the walls, sometimes even through stone features to put in electrical cables for lighting water lines, what have you, for the reconstructed gate. So a lot of this forensic archaeology, looking at restoration projects that were conducted uh, right up to the time of the ISIS occupation. 
The area J here, looking to the north, you can see again the divots at the base of these limestone orthostats along this area. You've got the baked brick of the mod loom reconstruction. Oftentimes when mod loom was reconstructing, this would have been the base of an archway on the eastern side of the entrance to the gate where he was concerned about the structural integrity of his masonry. He dug down and put in these, these concrete slabs, which further, of course, disturbed the lower archeological deposits. In this case, what we found, we excavated the remains, uh, the lowest part of the Islamic State destruction level, which you can see on either side of the trench here. This is Modlum's baked brick, and unfortunately using cement mortars, uh, some concrete flat work. And then below that, very close to the surface of Modlum's reconstruction, we find the final original floor level of the late Assyrian gateway. This floor surface is constructed out of bitumen and limestone chipping. It's very obvious. And as we followed it to the north, we found that it turned up along what is a mud brick feature that looks like a mud brick wall shown here. It's a little bit better in the next view. This is looking to the west. You can see a mud brick wall running through the entrance to the gate. This last floor surface and the abutment of that bitumen and limestone floor with this mud brick feature. And what this looks like, it's been cut by the cement of Modlum's reconstruction and by this trench here, but it looks like a narrowing of the gate in its final phase, which is similar to other, other gates at, as, as other excavators have found previously at the site of Nineveh, possibly as a latch, last dish effort to try to protect the city from, its, its, from the siege. Below this level, in the fill of, of the ramp leading up into the gate, we have, and, and again, intact archeological deposits, we had some surprising finds, um, the, the most surprising of which was a library quality fragment of a, an Assyrian version of the Mard, Marduk ordeal, where Marduk is humiliated. Um, this is a text, a literary text that comes from after the time of the uh, Syrian destruction of Babylon and the carrying off of the statue of Marduk was an attempt to, to explain how this might have happened. Um, probably dates from the reign of Sennacherib, but it was later smashed up. And then we find pieces of it buried in, in this ramp, possibly from the time of Esar Hodden or later and talking with John McGinnis about that, who's worked on the text. After a time when Marduk was, was returned to Babylon and the city was essentially reestablished, well, or at least rebuilt. So again, a lot of intact archeology span below the 612 destruction level that's waiting to be excavated prior to our reconstruction of the gate. Uh, and talking about intact parts of the gate, uh, if you're familiar with Maud Loom's reports, one of the features that Maud Loom found in the Southeast corner of the hall that was really intriguing to us was an intact archway or a doorway leading to the south from the hall of the gate. You can see, you see it here. There's a finished corner in the orthostats and you've got the ends of two slabs running in. And Maudloom reports finding sun, the sun-dried bricks of part of an arch. Now this is Maudloom's reconstruction of that. And then this was blocked up by Maudloom and then again later by SBAH because looters were beginning to excavate into this area in the 1990s. So they bricked it back up. So uh, this, is, this is largely, at least this blocking dates to, dates to the 1990s. So we were, we were interested in excavating this area and opened up that blocking and began excavations in this area, FLN, what is now called room one in our 2022 season. We believe there was probably a doorway from this area into the hall, we found a, a limestone door hold fast in the upper fill of this area, as well as a sculpted door pivot. Now these might have fallen from an upper story into room one. We have a lot of reason to believe that there's a lot of material from an upper story that's fallen into this corridor that we've excavated. And we have not found in situ door pivots in the area in area D or area H or any, anywhere in this area yet but there probably was a doorway leading into this corridor from the hall. 
And as we began to excavate this area, we found that there was some possible post-Assyrian modifications in the uppermost levels. You can see the, the, the level here of the orthostat. So well above the floor level of the hall in this corridor or room one, there were some signs of modifications in the upper level debris, but this could date to the time when the looters were inside this structure. I doubt it. Uh, and, and there were multiple floor surfaces up in the upper level of the debris, sherds, bricks, but we're not talking Hellenistic or Parthian sorts of material. Uh, it all appears to be late, late Assyrian, so that's going to require some more work on our part. We also found immediately in, in the, the uh, northern area, area F, the uh, not a burial, but the, the, the skeletal remains of an infant in a contorted position in collapsed baked brick. A lot of what we're excavating in this area in terms of fill is collapsed baked brick, which we'll talk about here in a second. This was, there were some adult, uh, adult ribs in this area as well, but we didn't find much by way of the rest of the adult skeleton. These do not appear to be burials, but rather individuals that fell with the collapse of the upper story and possibly the and, and the vault, big brick vault of room one when the building was burned. So again, possible victims of the 612 attack on Nineveh. And this is what the stratigraphy basically looks like inside this corridor looking south. You've got, you know, uh, slabs running all the way to the end, about seven to seven meters 20 worth of slabs on the, on the east and west side of the corridor. There is one intentional gap in those slabs. There are Mosul marble pieces laying in the fill, and you can see there are multiple floor levels. This is the collapse of the brick here in the back of the photo. Moving forward, you can see some of the latest floor levels and the, the artifactual debris that we're finding inside that fill, and then the earlier floor levels down to the level of Sennacherib. So again, a Sennacherib surface, intermediate floor levels, then this burn destruction debris and the collapse of the upper stories, a catastrophic collapse of the upper stories of the gate structure. We noted very early on that these, these slabs were carved. You, we could see mountain scales on these. There's a close up of them. We could see the fronds of palm trees and other vegetation. And we could see the outlines of what looked like, but turned 90 degrees, the outlines of Assyrian soldiers, in this case, archers with pointed helmets, their arms and bows but we weren't really finding much by way of intact relief carving on the upper portions of the slabs. They had been, most of the relief carving had been chiseled away. So a deliberate erasure of these slabs when they were moved in at a later time period. This is the final orthostat on the, the, the other side of the gateway. You can see how the slabs just end and there's a T in this corridor and these slabs extend into the next room. They go beyond the mud brick walls behind them. And what you see here on the right-hand side is the collapsed big brick debris inside the next chamber to the south, which forms a T with room one. Looking behind this slab where it projected into the next room, you can see that T chamber. Here, we could see that there was intact relief carving on the back of this slab on its lowermost portion. We could see the feet of individuals in a file. Here they are turned 90 degrees so that you're looking at them in the right way. You can see some of it's been erased with a sharp chisel, but some of it, the further down we went on this slab, the more intact the relief carving appeared to be. Now on the other side of this slab, there is an erased inscription panel presumably of Sennacherib. We'll talk about that here in a second. So this is what the excavations look like of this corridor down to the destruction level surface of 612 that you can see we haven't removed in this photograph, the, the collapsed debris from the T chamber down at the end or rooms two and three. So we had a row of these. These two orthostats on this side, on the east side, and the two orthostats on the west side were probably original to the building. They're like the orthostats in the hall. The orthostats beyond that point, and there are seven beyond that point, are in Mosul marble, and they had originally had relief carving on them. It looked to be probably from the time of Sennacherib, but the upper parts of that had been erased. And it wasn't until we removed this final floor or the, the, the destruction level floor that we had a bit of a surprise. But first, I to kind of give you some idea 
of the, the debris from the areas of rooms two and three. You can see we found a lot of collapsed baked brick. He's had Sennacherib palace inscriptions on them. This is probably from a vaulted roof, a lot like what uh, Dr. Marchetti is finding at his gateway. Intact, ours is, our, our vaulting is all collapsed. And this is that area once it's been cleaned out. There's a hearth in this area at this end of, of the tea room. And there's an area in front of it that's recessed in the floor, possibly for the removal of ash. So there's some sort of pyrotechnic installation there. On the opposite end of this in area N, what you see here is our section looking to the south. And this is the mud brick of the wall. And then we have the, the intact debris inside of the corridor here as it continues to the south. There's large, uh, large baked uh, brick paving pieces, baked bricks, there's chunks of stone that have collapsed, and then a lot of intact or fairly intact pottery, and a lot of objects, burned wooden architectural members, what have you in this fill deposit. Once we removed the floor, we had a big surprise. As we excavated down to the intermediate and then the initial Sennacherib floor, you can see this is the destruction level floor surface here. We began finding the remains of a wall trench where these slabs were set down in. So certainly Sennacherib uh, set in along the walls at a later time period. And these, once these were set into the wall trenches, we found that inside the fill of the wall trenches, there was the debris from the sawing down of these slabs. So they're taking larger slabs, sawing them into smaller pieces, turning them 90 degrees, setting them into the wall trench, and then using iron chisels, we found the remains of one of these in one of the wall trenches. They were knocking off the relief carving. You can see mountain scales, pieces of garments, the crenellated uh, tops of towers and fortification walls, bits of cuneiform inscriptions here at MG097, probably from the back of the slab. And again, pieces of garments, uh, arms and legs of people. There are a lot of these chips in the foundation trench and in the surrounding area. So these are cut from the, a very late, the latest floor surface down, and then the wall trenches are filled in. So these are a reuse of Sennacherib reliefs, almost surely from the Southwest Palace at Kiyunjik. These were either intended for the Southwest Palace or were installed there and then later recycled for lining the walls of this corridor, or at least the, the southernmost part of the corridor. So recycling and reuse context. Um, and, and so they were deliberately erased. And then you can see there's bitumen running down the sides of these. There was a lot of use of bitumen, probably for, for, well, for waterproofing in this area. It runs down the slabs and then onto the latest floor level. So really great stratigraphic tie-ins in this building, this part of the building. So again, we could you know, initially see these tantalizing bits of the, the erased reliefs. And then once you remove the floor, as you can see here on slab 60, parts of these slabs. Again, the slabs are turned 90 degrees, so frequently we're, we're getting the bases of slabs running up this way. The divots for the bases of slabs sometimes are you know, showing above the floor level, and we're getting the tapered edges of the slabs. Would have been the top of the slab here, now the side of the slab. So moving around the room, I mean, they're just really beautiful, so well preserved. In these lower portions, you can see our two archers, walking through this mountainous landscape and then clusters of grapes and fig trees and, and other sorts of vegetation. The, the best parallels again at the Southwest Palace for this are Lachish or Tel Adwer, the, the Assyrian campaigns in the Levant, which are shown in the area of Court 64, but especially Room 36, where the Lachish reliefs were found by Layard. So um, 
again, I'm not saying it's Lakish, but it, it certainly looks like Sennacherib's campaign of 701 to put down the rebellions in the Levant uh, that had occurred in 705. Next to the slab we were just looking at, this is slab 67. You can see how erased the upper part of this is, but the lower part shows, uh, and here you see it on the right-hand side, turned, turned right side up as it would have been in the palace, uh, the Southwest Palace. You're looking at the top-down view of a military camp. Now, what's really interesting about this particular slab, you have the back of an Assyrian soldier here with his, his scabbards, right? There are captives at the bottom, this man probably has his hands bound in front of his face. This individual is turned looking backward, probably being hit with a stick or something by an Assyrian soldier. It's a fairly familiar sort of procession of prisoners. And then you've got recumbent animals around tents and other structures inside the Assyrian camp. You can see the outlines of tent here and some of its, its interior features, probably furniture. These are uh, cloven, cloven legs or feet of furniture on this side of it. Right. And then this portion of the relief is unfinished. If you look at the towers here, you can see that they have these triangular crenellations and the windows are done. But as you move up, the, this, this particular slab isn't finished. Was it used in the Southwest Palace? Was it you know, coming from a workshop somewhere and it was never finished? Well, my understanding is that these slabs were put in place and then were carved. Are they from some part of the Southwest Palace depicting uh, camp, the campaign in the Levant that, that was never finished? A lot of different interpretations for this. If you believe that these slabs are carved in place, maybe they were rejects and then removed and then new slabs were brought in. But they have very good parallels with the Southwest Palace, obviously. This is the same slab here with uh, close-ups of, of the animals. You have two recumbent curly horned rams. And you can see these this wonderful depictions of the Assyrian camp and a recumbent bull here. There's a horse feeding out of a trough. And then you can see the close-up of these bearded prisoners with the, uh, these fillets that they're wearing or headbands. This one fairly well intact. This one has been just hacked to pieces. As we move to the south from that slab, there was this deliberate gap left. We call this slab 68, but there was no slab 68. And from the tops of the slabs down, this space was left open as a kind of, of a niche. Uh, there, there wasn't a doorway. There's Solid mud brick behind this, but we had really wonderful burn debris up here from the collapse of the upper part of the gateway in the 612 destruction. And then you can see the, you know, the intact floor level and then the stone chips coming down into the trench here and coming down this way. But this part of the, of the, the floor was left intact. These are earlier floor levels that are intermediate floors that were left and not cut by the wall trenches on either side. And you can see also, as you go from North to south, the slabs are stepping up here markedly before you come to the T-chamber here, right? This T-shaped chamber, or rooms two and three. This uh, corridor slopes up about 30 to 40 centimeters, or 35 centimeters by the time you get to the end of it. So what you're moving to the south uphill, presumably it's a ramp or moving towards a stairwell that leads up to the upper levels of the, of the Moshki Gate. You can see here the adjacent slab has files of Assyrian soldiers with buckler, shields, spears, crested helmets. And, and here again, you can't see the tops of these guys, but these are spearmen. So two, two files of spearmen, and then these soldiers in front have been deliberately erased. Close-ups of both, uh, incredibly well-preserved, except hey, <laughs> where they've been hit with chisels by by. You know, I presumably Shin Shar Iskun's uh, laborers. I, these chisel marks look like they're, they're so fresh that some of the media coming in thought that this was damage from the Islamic State destruction. We had to keep emphasizing these are new areas that have not been previously excavated. This was done by the Assyrians and erasing these slabs themselves. Now, around to the other side again, this is slab 70. This is where we first saw the relief carving. This is the erased inscription panel. Again, you can see the, the fill of room three behind it. And when we moved this slab out so that we could see behind it, since it was a small slab, we could easily move it away from the wall. You can see a file of deportees. There are Assyrian soldiers. You can see the musculature over here, but there's a, a bowman over here, a couple of Assyrian soldiers leading these. Presumably these are women. You can see their headdresses. They've got sacks over their shoulders and they're carrying these funny little containers. There's a 
couple of articles that have been written about these types of containers, but it looks a lot like prisoners in the Levant. This next slab to the north, probably the best preserved slab that we have, slab 71, um, shows Assyrian archers in this, this uh, you know, wooded, wooded mountainscape. You can see other Assyrian soldiers above them, possibly archers or slingers. And then there's a kneeling archer that you can see just progressively erased as you go up the slab here, kneeling in front of these, these two standing archers. And then you've got just this repetition as you move up the slab. Um, we use tracing paper to go over these with, with, uh, with crayons so that we could actually draw out in our, in our, in our drawings. We could actually, you know, so sort of supplement our macro photography and 3D scanning. Um, we, we traced over these and to, to get some of this erased relief carving. And some of it's, it's, it's even possible to pull out at the very tops of the slabs. So I'm gonna be spending a lot of time drawing these up. As we move further to the north, a really spectacular piece here, um, really beautiful trees and a mountain landscape and grapes over here. Um, you've got the entrance to a fortified Assyrian encampment and an epigraph right here that was partially erased, but thankfully not completely erased. And you can see the entrance to the camp here. There's an Assyrian soldier or a statue in the entrance to the gateway. And that, thanks to John McGinnis has looked at this epigraph for us. It's a camp of Sennacherib, king of the world, great king, mighty king, king of Assyria. Thank you for leaving that intact, that they were really happy they didn't erase that bit. Um, very helpful. And at the top of the slab, Darren Ashby, one day, I thought he was kidding, said, I think I see graffiti. Um, and this graffiti is oriented to the viewer. Well, unlike the slabs, you know, the relief carvings turn 90 degrees. At the top of this slab, you have Assyrian males, bearded males that look a lot like a king, holding a mace in this case. There are floating heads. Uh, you can, there's a head on whatever this is here. Uh, there's a man with a very long nose. There's another bearded Assyrian individual down here. And as you get to looking around, there's a lot of this graffiti, but there, this is a, a pointed based pot with a strap handle and a very narrow, narrow neck and mouth. So really exciting sorts of finds uh, showing that these, these slabs, once they were brought in, recycled, put in place, you know, that there was time for people to be carving into them. Then again, moving to slab 73 on the east side, again to the north. This is a base slab. You can see its divot here and the thickened base that was below the floor level in the Southwest Palace. And the floor level in the Southwest Palace would have been about this level, presumably. And then you can see the slab shows, and it's the ba a base slab that's been sawn down um, with this lush, lush vegetation. You can see the bits of trees moving up, you know, in these erased portions as well. So a repetition of vegetation at the bottom of this panel. So in terms of Comparanda from British Museum, this is BM124913. There's our camp, right? There's an Assyrian soldier with his scabbard, you same types of trees, exactly the same type of, of trees, mountain scales, similar Assyrian soldiers. Here's a comparison of our camp and the edges of it with, with BM. 1249-13, you can see the back of an Assyrian soldier, back of a Assyrian soldier, the roadway leading in. Ours extends past the entrance. We don't have mountain scales yet on our panel. This panel is not finished. You can see the, the way they show the camp architecture, the recumbent animals and horses, it's very similar. Our archers, uh, BM124905, archers in a, a mountain landscape, a really close parallels. Again, I'm not saying it's Lachish, but certainly uh, Sennacherib and from probably the area of Court 64, which has the, the campaigns against, against the, the Levant. And objects from inside this room. One would have thought Mashki Gate, destruction level, soldiers, arms, armor. No, uh, ritual, magic, purification. Uh, the objects inside, a lot of pottery, a lot of bronze nails, iron nails, implements, uh, a lot of raw materials, a lot of, of semi-precious stone in chunks and chunks of re Mosul marble that appear to be uh, being reused. Presumably this material is falling from the upper story. It's above the floor level. There's not much on the final floor. The spectacular Lamashtu amulet, uh, Mashki Gate text 001 or find 14, that shows uh, Lamash 2 
and a lot of other things going on. So in the first register, this would have been facing out when someone wore this amulet, you have divine symbols here, uh, seven circles for the Sabiti, a star, a horned headdress, a wing disc, and a crescent. So the, the icons of various gods and goddesses. Register two of the amulet shows seven animal-headed figures, snake, eagle, pig, dog, ibex, ram, and lion, or the Urigalu. John McGinnis is currently working on this for us. And then register three, Lamashtu holding snakes. There are the snakes. Lamashtu has donkey ears, donkey teeth, a lioness's head, shown in a really sort of, you know, terrible mishphasen sort of mixed animal sort of way. And then various objects around Lamashtu, you have a pot of oil, you have a bull with a lid, a, a fibula here, a comb, and then a centipede, a textile, a lamp on a stand, and a scorpion. And then below here, you have a damaged Pazuzu head. And then there's an ind individual over here that is maybe out of an object or possibly a lulal. I'm not really sure. Typical. And then on the other side of the amulet that would have been worn towards the person, you have Pazuzu, but Pazuzu, of course, being controlled by a pair of Ugalu. Now, it's I would have expected Ugalu and maybe Lulal controlling Pazuzu. Pazuzu is there to ward off Lamashtu for pregnant women and women who are breastfeeding. Lamashtu preys upon pregnant women and women with infants, kidnaps children. And these amulets with their incantations are used to ward, of course, ward off Lamashtu, a lot like the, the Judaic Lilith. And then P Pazuzu, the, the demon of the southwest wind, is used again to, to ward off Lamashtu. And then Ugalu, in oftentimes Lulal, but we don't have Lulal, are used to keep Pazuzu under control. And then we have this difficult to read uh, Pazuzu standard inscription B, which again, John McGinnis and some folks at the British Museum are working on now for publication. Not what we would expected in the upper level debris of Corridor 1. We also have fragments of foundation tablets in Neo-Assyrian script, but alas, um, not much on them by way of identification of a building. And limestone and in Mosul marble or gypsum. And surprisingly, fragments of cuneiform tablets that were presumably baked in the fire that destroyed the Mashki Gate. We have three of these from this area, and these are incantations written in Sumerian, I am told, in a Neo-Babylonian script. John McGinnis and, and other, other folks, Irving Finkel, can comment on this, but these are, I am told, from the series Beit Rimki, and if so, are a previously unknown part of this purification ritual. Um, very exciting finds, but again, the associations here with Mashki Gate seem to be protective magic incantations and purification. So um, moving at a gallop here, I'm going to now talk about our excavations at Nimrud and, and wrap up here on time. Uh, we, we are also conducting excavations at the site of Nimrud. Um, in this case, we have a permit that allows us to work in the area of the Ishtar Temple, or also called the Sharat Nifi Temple, near the Ziggurat and the Temple of Ninurta, to the north of the Northwest Palace. And we're also excavating in what is called by David Kirtai, an archaeological nightmare, the area south of the Northwest Palace, in the area of the so-called Shalmaneser building and Layard's upper chambers. This is an infamous area that is really confusing in terms of its architecture, and we feel really fortunate to be able to work in both of these areas. Our excavations in the Ishtar temple are to clear the ISIS destruction, excavate new areas around the temple that was first excavated by Layard, and then rebuild the rebuilding that was done by uh, uh, Mazaham Hussain. So, Again, rebuilding a, a rebuild that was destroyed by ISIS. And the area of Adad Narari's palace and the Shalmaneser building were trying to sort out long-standing research questions regarding the architecture of this area that is presumably following the work of Julian Reed, David Cartat, and others. This is uh, an extension of the Northwest Palace built by Adad Narari. Uh, it, it appears to be a residential reception suite possibly built by Adad Narari for his very important mother, Shama Ramat, sometime during his reign. So 
uh, a little bit about of our results. This shows the pre-ISIS stage 2013 uh, of this part of the North Mound, Citadel Mound of Nimrud. You see the ziggurat in the, off in the distance there and Mazaham's reconstruction, amazing reconstruction based on his excavations of the Ishtar temple, this vaulted entrance area, and then this really spectacular facade in baked brick. Here's a different view from the ziggurat looking out towards Fort Shalmaneser in the distance. These are the brick kilns that SBAH has used for these recon to make the baked brick for these reconstruction. And you can see the various excavation areas here. Uh, this is the courtyard of the Ishtar temple. This is an intact area of fill, a stratified fill that was never excavated that we'll be excavating in our 2023 season. And then, of course, this was destroyed by ISIS. This happened while I was working with ACE or CHI. We put out a number of reports for the State Department on this. These are the before satellite images of the ziggurat and the, the temple of Ishtar. And then ISIS brought in earth movers and they trenched in areas and then they, they leveled the ziggurat out quite a bit and they knocked down the reconstruction of the Ishtar temple forming a little mound in that area. So this is what it looks like now in 2022. This is uh, during our work. Part of our team cleared the ISIS debris by hand, very carefully from the Ishtar temple. We didn't want to use machinery to do this because there are paved surfaces and a lot of features inside the building. So at this point, the building has been cleared out. Um, there's not a lot to really report in the time that I have, uh, but essentially the lower parts of the building are fairly intact and the surrounding archeology span does not appear to have been looted by ISIS. So we will begin to excavate the area between this temple and the Ishtar temple, sorry, and, and expand out from this area to better understand the architecture we will put a roof over parts of this building, and then we will reestablish the pottery kilns at Nimrud, which were also destroyed by ISIS, so that we can produce Assyrian-sized baked bricks, so that we can be, begin to rebuild these reconstructions. ISIS didn't really tear up the lower parts of the building and the sculptures that are inside of it. In the area south of the Northwest Palace, to talk about the upper chambers a little bit, this area was first excavated by Laird in the late 1840s. It's very poorly known. Laird reported on it in, in his, his popular books, but he reports finding three chambers that were preserved very high up, hence the name, the upper chambers. It's clear that his workmen trenched in from the west into the east in an exploratory trench from the west side of the Citadel Mound at Nimrud. And it wasn't until they had been working for some time in this area of this lustration slab that they realized they were cutting into a very high, well-preserved mud brick building without orthostats, not kind of threw them off a little bit, and that they were finding a lot of wall paintings, polychrome wall paintings in blue, black, white, yellow, and red. Uh, multiple layers of these wall paintings on the walls of the upper chambers. Laird found two inscribed door sills here and here, a lustration slab, and unusually a very odd looking lustration slab in terms of its position, because it was in front of a doorway, which is not usually where these slabs are located. And he shows two oddly sized, uh, and the fact that they're pairs, two tram rails or so-called tram rails, sorry, it should be two words, tram rail. Uh, on either side of the lustration slab. Now, usually there are only one of these and they're used for wheeled, to bring wheeled braziers that are used for heating up near throne bases. And they're also associated with these lustration slabs. They may have held liquids that were heated or brought, they were used to bring liquids up to these lustration slabs. There's a number of different interpretations of the, how these slabs are used and how these tram rails were used. I'll show you, you know, some pictures of them here in a minute. Um, Again, it's, it's weird that they, he shows it in front of a doorway, this lustration slab. It's unusual that you have a pair of these tram rails in the loop. It just, something looks wrong. And you know, a lot, of, a lot of scholars have written about this, especially David Kirtai, who has sort of pulled all of the different evidence together, talking about why this probably is incorrect and that there probably were mistakes made during the publication of Laird's volumes. This is, Laird took away one of these slabs, this one here in this doorway, 
which is now in the British Museum. It's clear from the dimensions of this slab in the British Museum and its thickness that it was sawed down for shipment. And one of the things that we found during our excavations in this area here, which I'll show you, is we found the stone chips from the reduction of the slab so that it was easier to, to handle for shipment all along this wall here. This slab is still in place. These slabs provide the genealogy of King Adad Narari III. And Laird was very excited to find these because it provided a sequence of rulers that he knew that he knew the names of, at least the cuneiform signs of, from the Northwest Palace. So here again, after Laird's excavations, this area was excavated by Loftus in 1854-55 time period. Um, and what we have from Loftus, of course, Loftus then went off to do a geological survey of India and died on the boat back to England, unfortunately, tragically. So there's not a lot of information out there about Loftus and his finds. But Boucher, his artist and draftsman, provided a map and plans, set of plans of the excavations that Loftus had, had done, as well as, as, as Loftus's predecessors, uh, Rassam and, and Laird. And you get this, uh, it's called the center palace at the edge of the mound. Its location is not exactly right. This center palace shows bits of what really is the Northwest Palace here. And then this, this odd bit of new building. So you've got Laird's remains here. Laird's tram lines in Boucher have become walls. You can see the lustration slab here. And then there are all these new walls that we assume Loftus excavated, but it's very difficult to understand how they relate to the upper chambers. Again, David Kirtai spent a lot of time looking at this, and we'll talk about the archaeological realities of that. But here's so here's Laird. Here's Laird's part on the Loftus plan. And what I've done is I've rotated the Loftus plan around so that you can see this very odd uh, sort of pastiche of architecture. Um, really a hodgepodge of, I mean, what you're looking at, you know, if you close your eyes and shake your head back and forth, it, it sort of looks like you've got a reception suite or a residential reception suite going on. But again, it's very difficult to interpret. So what we found from our excavations and also in looking at what Mazahim Hussein found in 1993. So this area was re-excavated in 1993 by Mazahim Hussein. So we've looked at all of those results. Um, at looking at Laird, and I'll show, show you our photos of our excavations here in a second. But you have to move Laird's lustration slab and one tram rail to the south significantly. Laird shows it 3.14 meters too far to the north, and we have no second tram rail set on this side of the lustration slab. And we verified then the rest of what Laird found, but except that Laird makes this slab 50% too wide. He's got the north-south dimension of it right. But east-west, he's made the slab square, which is like the ones he was familiar with from the Northwest Palace. He's really, how much Laird actually saw this excavation is kind of open, open for a question. When you come to Loftus's plan, Kertai and others are, are correct and that this needs to be moved substantially to the north and east. If you take Loftus's walls and you move them up this way, that's the architectural plan that we've found, which is shown here at the right from our 2022 results. That plan combines Mazaham Hussein's 1993 excavations. Mazaham excavated these rooms here, re-excavated these areas that Laird had excavated, found that this room was a bathroom. This is a type of vestibule, and this is a storage room, according to Mazaham. He also, Mazaham, Mazaham found a single tram line at an odd angle in this area, although he doesn't really discuss it in his publication. And if you look at Mazaham's publication, 2013 publication, there is another lustration slab in this corner, but I believe it's not mentioned. It's just shown in one of the photos. Now, Loftus also found a slab in this doorway to room two that provided a historic inscription of some of Adad Narari's uh, campaigns. That is no longer present. It was up until the, the time Mazaham worked, these slabs were published by Ali Jaburi. Um, uh, during Mazaham's 1993 campaign, but this slab was reportedly removed from the, the Adad Narari Palace and is hidden somewhere in the Northwest Palace, but we have not been able yet to locate it. It was hidden to prevent uh, vandalism. 
Now, there are a number of other inscriptions that are attributed to Loftus that were published by scholars that are listed from here. There are a couple, at least two of that I'm aware of, historical inscriptions. There are the two uh, genealogical inscriptions of Adad Narari, and then some other fragments, and we've added to those fragments in our, our excavations. So this is, we primarily re-excavated the, these areas that Loftus and Laird had worked in and that Mazaham had worked in, and then we began to excavate new areas to the south in this long rectangular part of the residential reception suite of Adad Narari's palace area. So excavating, you're looking here to the south, and we immediately began to find things that were very surprising. First of all, this is, this is architecture that Loftus shows on his plan, but Loftus was tracing the tops of the walls. We can tell from, and he was not excavating down in most areas into the fills of the rooms. He was looking for doorways. He was looking for the signs of sculpture from the top, looking for orthostats. And so while we have this plan of Loftus's excavations in the 1850s, he really didn't dig down into the buildings. Now that subsequently caused a lot of disturbance to the site. The brick is dried out. There's a lot of really, really damaged mud brick in the areas that Loftus and other people have worked in. So we're looking at you know previous excavations in these areas. But as you get down into the fills of the room, the brick's a lot more intact. You can see there's collapsed brick on the floor of the Adad Narari structure. This is the final floor. There are multiple floors in Adad Narari's palace. There's this large alabastron. And you can see this very unusual column base with an iron core it's made out of gypsum or Mosul marble, round base, uh, tapering, curving base to a column with these raised bands. Um, having worked on Hassan Lu, I'm now convinced that column halls are following me everywhere I go. We only have one of these right now. And here, here you can see its dimensions here in the size of that iron rod at its center. Is it really a column base? Is this a base for some sort of other feature? Well, in the upper fill, while we were excavating the upper collapse of this same area of room two, we found what looks like a capital, uh, 42 by 42 centimeters at the top, shaft uh, height 19 centimeters with a diameter of 28 centimeters. I'm, a, you know, initial hypothesis that this is used for a wooden shaft of a column and that the iron is used to hold it on there and that there's a stone, stone capital at the top, but I am, I am, I would be happy to hear suggestions from, from all of you today. There's the alabastron with its 12 dots. Maybe there was another dot over here. That's ancient damage. Alabastron, slightly damaged, but it holds almost exactly 20 liters. So again, some, some very intact floor deposits in room two. I'm not gonna go into the small finds today for a lack of time, but there are ivories, a lot of reconstructable Neo-Assyrian standardized pottery. And we've got a lot of fragments of wall paintings, um, the same color scheme and the same designs as are published by Laird's in Laird's Monuments volume, if you're familiar with the color plates. Um, so, but, and a lot of, of new, new design elements as well. Uh, in the area of the doorway of room two and previously excavated areas, we found a lot of fragments of an inscribed uh, door pivot box and a lot of other bits of inscribed Mosul marble, pieces from, from door slabs and, and, and what have you. What I'm, none of this is reported by Laird or by Loftus. What may have happened is after these excavations in the mid 19th century, there was some disturbance to the site prior to Mazaham's excavations and people were coming in and were, were tearing apart the tram line that Laird had found and were finding other bits that were either left there and went unreported or dug into some of the, the bulks and we're finding Mosul marble architectural features. Moving up to room four, we re-excavated that. There's the biographical inscription on the door sill of Adad Narari. And this is a baked brick floor paving in room four. And to our surprise, unreported, they had Adad Narari brick stamps on, on, on several of the bricks. Palace of Adad Narari, that was a nice find that was not previously reported. And there's a close-up of the, the spectacular Adad Narari, the third genealogical slab that we were so happy to see had not been damaged by time, the elements, or by the Islamic State. In room six, to wrap up, the, the, you know, the great puzzle of Laird's lustration slab and tram lines, what we found was 
At some point after Laird's excavations, a pit was dug here and parts of his part of his tram line was chucked into that. Parts of the tram line were missing. You saw that in one of my previous photos, but another part of the tram line was found, we found in situ. There's the lustration slab and its actual dimensions with its tram line. And you can see that there is a circular depression here. It had just rained. I apologize for the photo. It had just rained. Um, there's a lip around the edges of it. This is not a pierced depression. And you can see the dimensions of that. It's a bowl-shaped depression, presumably maybe to, to be able to scoop liquids out when there's liquids inside the lustration slab, or possibly to set something into a, a large jar, a brazier, something like that. There's a lot of different interpretations of these slabs, but that's its correct location. And we've waited since the 1840s to <laughs> correct that, that, that on page 14 of Laird's publication. So to wrap up, what are our objectives for the future? Well, before I, before I wrap up, what did we find in this area? There was actually a lot left in terms of the floor deposits. While Laird and others have excavated in this area, this, this, this section of floor just to the north of the slab, we found a lot of in-situ ivories, mostly with floral designs on them, and lots of fragments of iron and a, a lot of pottery and, uh, and, and pieces of, of painted plaster from the wall paintings. So our 2023 season at Moshki Gate, we will resume the rebuilding of the gate now for use as a visitor center and exhibit space for the Sennacherib reliefs. Uh, Nineveh inspections would like to make Moshki Gate the departure point for visitors to Nineveh, where there would be some you know, information panels. And now, hopefully, if, if SBAH so, so decides, we would have the, the reliefs on display there. Uh, we're not sure exactly where the reliefs are going to go, but we will need to remove them from their current location, probably. Um, and we will continue excavations of the new chambers that we have to the south. So we'll continue south, excavating into the fortification wall to follow our southern chamber to see if it's leading to a stairwell or whether this is a ramp. Um, for example, like as shown on plans in the Nergal Gate. And at Nimrud, Nimrud, we will now start our excavations of new areas of the Ishtar Temple, particularly in the west where it adjoins the Ninurta Temple to resolve the interconnections between those two buildings. And we'll establish our, our brick kilns at Nimrud for our reconstruction projects. And we're now going to excavate new areas of the Adad Narari Palace and the adjacent to the east, the adjacent Shalmaneser building to see, in fact, whether those two buildings were not in connected through doorways in antiquity. And we'll begin looking for some of the major features of this Shalmaneser building, like the so-called Loftus Bulls that are located to the south of the Adad Narari building. We want to begin to resolve some of the mapping and architectural relationship issues that have been you know, longstanding. Some, some cases for over a century in, the, in those excavated areas. I would be remiss if I did not thank uh, the, the, the very helpful and kind staff of Nineveh Inspections and, and, and SBAH in Baghdad, who afforded us with this spectacular opportunity to work at Nineveh and Nimrud, and, and the, the, the leadership of the University of Pennsylvania Museum and the Olive Foundation, who are funding a lot of our work at Moshki Gate, and our, our wonderful excavation team uh, who participated in the 2022 excavations from SBAH, British Museum and elsewhere. Thank you very much.